Any other questions? And I'll, I guess I can get into the lecture otherwise, but any other yeah, questions? Are we, um, are we starting chapter four today then, right? Yeah, you know what? We've been actually touching on four and, and while we've been doing three a little bit, starting last time. The okay. picture I'm showing up here is actually chapter, it's a mix of chapter three and four. Uh, so we're going to try to be segueing into chapter four this time. And uh, I'll tell you when we get to that point that we were clearly in chapter four territory. Um, but that's a good question. All right, well, let's go into this right now. Um, what last time we introduced torque and I'm done doing this in a way where I'm really trying to push us into talking about actual rotating machines uh, as quickly as we can and getting past the basic theory of chapter three. So three is very theoretical. And, um, but there are a couple points I want to point out right here. This is a, a, a picture from a slide that is from actually module five, but to review from the last time, we, we've shown how we could derive um, force from energy and co-energy. This is a theoretical type of a derivation, but uh, as if you, as you understand everything. You just remind me where's that negative came from? It's a great question. Um, very good question. Let's go back to the previous. So I'm going to go back here to the last lecture. And I think that you can see it there. Uh, let me know. I'm going to go to the textbook because I think it might be a little clearer on that one. It's really just a matter of uh, convention, first of all. Uh, but to, if you really to understand how we came up with that expression, and you want to review it in the textbook, go to the very beginning of chapter three. I don't start out with this because because it's kind of Essentially, I end with it because this is this is a good place to start talking about real machines, and the rest of it is more better talking about uh, transient type of torque and some of the theory. But the bottom line is looking at this particular example right here. The current is going into the where the X is going into the paper and then it's coming out of the paper where you have the dot, right? So it's essentially trying to emphasize these two points right here. And now I gotta get this off here. It's really just a matter of the direction of the right-hand rule that gets us to that negative sign. So you're doing a cross product. It's not right hand rule, it's a cross product, but you know, you use your uh, kind of thinking about the, like if I look at going into the, into the paper and they, they show this picture right here where they say the, uh, um, let's see, I always, I don't like this. This picture it's different from what I would use but the B is going up from the bottom to the top and so the the north is on the top and the south is on the bottom and so when you do the cross product because of the direction of the B with respect to the direction of the length of the sh of the coil going into the 
the paper when you, you just come out with a negative sign. It's not really insightful, and this example doesn't really give us a lot of insight into that. Um, but there's, it, it's, it is more, there's more insight if, once we get into synchronous machines, but we don't really go into the detail of calculating the torque with the synchronous machine. So in a way, you just kind of have, because of the so, time constraint, you just kind of have to accept this. this if you I'm don't mind you. Uh, interrupt yeah. you, is, is that has anything, uh, if you want to understand it differently, has anything with do, to do with the uh, alpha? Is the negative of alpha? And because yeah. sine is not, uh, it's not like cosine, we have to always get the negative out of the uh, sine outside. And uh, that means is everything pointing to the actual perpendicular to the uh, line of rotation that's what they mean with it yeah yeah the alpha is the del in the other picture that i have in it, it's i'm not sure surely exactly sure what you mean by perpendicular to the line what do you mean by perpendicular to the line of rotation when you say that what do you mean by that uh because uh, if you go to the linear system, if I remember well from my physics class, they say torque is uh, basically force time uh, time the arm. Right, right. The, if, okay. Yeah. And and the for rota rotational arm here will be uh, the imaginary uh, the imaginary uh, line between the center and to the point of. Uh, affection which is uh, the wire itself yep that's so right so we have we have an r there and uh, then the pivot point there will be the actual axial of it so what they're saying is delta is the reflection of the same uh, what is called the alpha or delta what do you call it the yeah the actual uh, theta there so is the other one which is the negative of that thing which is is uh, perpendicular to the R, right there, outside of the wire. Well, the F in the picture that I showed you original, you're talking about force, not torque, right? Or are you talking about? If you're talking about yeah. just the force, or yeah, the it's same idea, same idea. The, yeah, it is. It comes the, out of the cross product, and it's just the direction that we've chosen for the current versus the flux. The B is in the Y. And the this imaginary arm going out to where the current is is going into the board, and so the resultant F is it's actually pointing, I think, in. But let me take it back to just let's go to the basic important principle. What you're what you're thinking about with the physics is a very it's all going to line up with that but we don't want to we're going to try to go beyond that physics uh, experiment to a machine that's actually you know being used to generate a continuous torque and so there's quite a bit of math and theory to get to a rotating machine, and that's what we're trying to get to. And it's really more a matter of just so much to cover, and I kind of have to pull out the top level important thing here. So the fact that it's negative, what's important here is this. The fact that this negative sign is there means that we're going to select if the del or the alpha is negative, we're going to call it a motor. That will give us a positive torque. And this, so the sign of the negative simply means that a negative torque angle gives me a positive torque. And so that is really the definition of a motor or an actuator. And if the angle is a positive angle, then you get a negative torque. And that's really the definition of a generator.
where you have to put torque into it to get power, electrical power out, as opposed to putting electrical power in and getting a torque out. And so that's kind of, is that helpful enough to... Uh, I got it. I got it. No. Yeah. yeah. So that's what you need to know. That's the thing. Okay. So right now there's a bunch of points right here. And this is the first, this point I want to make very clear to everybody. The second point is that if Dell is a plus or a minus 90, then for the amount of current that you're putting into the machine or that you're getting out of the machine, you get the most amount of torque. So you want to get as much torque for as minimal amount of current as possible. So that's what's called maximum torque per ampere. So clearly because it's a sign relationship, we want the del equals 90 gives us that. Now not all machines, we can't achieve this with every type of machine because there's, there's a price sometimes that is paid for doing this. And it really comes down to understanding the equivalent circuits for these machines. And that's what I'm hoping to get to, to introduce chapter four here at the end of this period. So anyway, that's the takeaway from this. And I assume, I assume that's more or less clear to everybody. So let's go, also go back to this what we when we very first introduced motor and generators and finding it, um, torque or force and i'm just showing torque now because instead of an x we're using a theta that means it's a rotational uh angle that's coming out it's moving if it's a motor or you're moving it if it's a generator and you're putting torque in or you're getting torque out. Now the torque, again, I think to review one thing, going back to the last notes, we use this expression here to go from force to torque. And so again, it's another right-hand rule and what you really have to think about is because of the direction of force and then you're moving from this center out to the what Mustafa called an arm that's a good way to think about it because we're actually going to call this an armature uh, that that's out at the end of the rotating uh, cylinder here um, because of the direction of the moving from the center out to the edge of the of the cylinder and doing a cross product with the force which is pushing out from there you're going to get a torque is actually along the axis of the shaft so it's just like a screwdriver right if you're trying to screw something in you're going to push down and turn your hand right and that's torque or a torque wrench you're trying to you know torque in a bolt or untorque a bolt okay so we went from force to torque and now we're we're using a similar relationships of everything we've derived except instead of using the linear position of x we're going to use an angular position theta and so all of these equations that we derive you've got the energy equation here is very similar to the uh, energy equation that we had derived previously except that we have this angle so the inductance is varying with an angular position and that's we derived this from uh you know from all this calculus stuff that we touched on the co-energy which is an easier thing to work with right here 
same expression, one half Li squared, but the L has an angular position dependency. In general, you can derive the torque the same way we derived the force from, as you recall, when we did the force, we did a partial derivative with respect to x. Now we're doing a partial derivative, derivative with respect to theta. And the energy has a angular dependency. Uh, there's this negative sign that comes out of the expression if you use energy. The other important point is that we are evaluating torque at a specific instantaneous value of flux. If we use co-energy, we use this expression here. There's no negative sign. It's the partial derivative of co-energy, and then it's evaluated at a specific value of current. And either of these expressions will simplify to this very key expression here. So really, the next exam, for example, if we want to think about, you know, what, what is it you need to know, is that we're going to apply, uh, I'm going to give you some examples of how we apply these equations. And we just need to know and understand, given what information we have, how to apply it to some really kind of physics-based problems right now, as opposed to practical problems but we're trying to get into the real practical scenarios. So everybody with me on that so far? Yep. Good. So we're going to stay for a moment with these, these relationships, and then we're going to eventually get into this realm again, the realm of this equation here, uh, when we get back into actual rotating machines. And um, so first of all, I want to give you an example. And this is a very simple, what I would call a reluctance motor. And one point I want to make about all of these examples that we're making um, is that we, we like to think about motors, you know, as rotating continuously. And that's a tricky thing to do, actually. And so all of these examples, we're really writing them in terms of scalar current values. So it's really like an instantaneous value of current that we're evaluating it at. So that would be like this current right here. Uh, in some cases, there may be a position dependency within the current. But ultimately, and this is just a precursor to where we're going, ultimately, these currents are going to be AC currents in one way or another. And in fact, every rotating machine ends up with AC armature currents. And I, I want... I want to go back to that at the end, and, and we'll talk about armatures and fields. But let's just get through this example. So what we have is, it's a motor. If this was going to continue, what I'm trying to say is that if this was going to have a continuous rotation, you know, where you've got an angular rotation theta, and it keeps moving, you'd have to play some tricks to make that work, and you'd have to have an AC alternating current uh, coming into this coil. And I'm not even sure if that would work. It would probably just go back and forth and back and forth. It wouldn't rotate in one direction, so it'd probably just go one way, the other way, one way, the other way. We don't really have a true rotating machine yet. But the so what we're really focusing on is just generating a torque um, which will move this this rotate this thing which can move in a rotational direction. Now the what we really have here is just like a typical magnetic component. We've got a winding around it, and we've got a core. 
that's what this this whole thing right here is a uh, iron core we're going to assume that the iron core has an infinite permeability now this particular problem i'm showing you is almost identical to a homework problem and it is example 3.6 i believe in the textbook so if you're having trouble with this problem go look at that example and review this lecture it's a little bit different but the reason why i'm then then uh, many of the other problems that we're showing and it, the reason I'm doing this is to really tie it back to the magnetic circuit. Now what we have, because we have a coil that's exciting this core, we're going to create a flux in the core and the flux is crossing a gap. So you can imagine that the flux lines are coming out and they're going to try to cross this gap into the moving part of this thing and then they're going to try and cross the gap here and so what you see is in this position there's just a portion of the uh, gap that the flux is crossing and everything that's outside like this portion of it right here there's no flux other than leakage flux that's going through it. And if you were to move this thing to say a 90 degrees angle like along that angle there, it would have no flux at all going through it. So if since we have a flux and we've got a coil, we've got a, um, a core, we can also apply Ampere's law and we can find we have an infinite permeability inside of the core so the only place where we're really going to have any reluctance that's non-zero is going to be in the gap and we are then therefore only really concerned about the air gap magnetic field intensity and so if you were to apply Ampere's law to this circuit you could find the H in the air gap and it would simply be equal to the number of turns times the current divided by the total gap. So you're going across the gap twice, 2G. So this is really coming from uh, H dot DL equals I, right? Or NI. It's, and we don't have to find the reluctance of the core because of the infinite. We just find the reluctance of the gap. So it's, it's quite simple. Uh, now what, what I'm going to introduce here is just a different way of looking at the energy or the co-energy in this case. Because So first of all, if I look at this problem, you say, well, what have I been given to work with to start with? there's a current. So I know that this is going to end up being a co-energy problem. Second thing is, remember that I told you that current is proportional to H. And that's clearly the case if we look at this expression here, right? Because the N is a, is a constant, the gap is a constant, and really that's what Ampere's law tells you. Also, um, B, and I don't know if this is going to be that important because we're not doing this with energy, we're doing it with co-energy, but there's a more difficult problem where we demonstrate this, but I'm not even going to go into it because of time, but B, or uh, flux, is proportional to B. So if I have a problem where I've been given current, I know I'm going to use co-energy. If I have a problem where I'm given flux, I know I'm going to use energy. 
And you've learned everything so far as far as what we've been doing in this chapter in terms of lambda and i. But we could easily instead go down the b and the h path, and that's what this is showing. And so what we can come up with is we can come up with an expression for the co-energy of this system. And that expression is simply this. The co-energy will be equal to the integral over the volume of mu naught, everything that's happening is only happening in the gap, times the square of the magnetic field intensity divided by 2. We're going to integrate that. Now what, what we're saying here is that this expression here, mu naught h ag squared over 2, has a duality or a correlation to one half L I squared. That's really what this expression is saying. And to work out the homework problem, you would have to know this. And so that's what I'm, I'm introducing. Mr. Kuzner, yeah. before you go further, can you tell me what's the subsequent uh, beside the H, uh, the first H uh, just below the, the graph is AG? Oh, yeah, AG. Yeah, AG. What's air AG? gap? Air gap. Air gap. Okay. I'm matching the homework problem. AG. So it's, and uh, so anyway, we're we're really introducing this this other way of looking at coenergy right here. All the rest is simply geometry, and here again the homework problem can help you. I mean, this we're not really trying to test your geometric skills, but how do you come up with the, uh, what's the volume that we're interested in? It's really the volume that I showed right here, what's happening in the gap. So if you were to imagine the, this little, uh, that's like the, um, the cross-sectional area is here, right? And then this is the width of the gap there. So we're really talking about what's the volume that the flux is occupying in the air gap, the total volume. That's what, that's what this is about here. And it's going to change because this thing is allowed to move. And so the expression, I won't go into how you get this, and if I, I encourage you to look at the example in, this is just because of time, but go look at the example in the uh, textbook. I'm using a little bit different uh, um, symbols than the textbook has, but what I have is the the length of the of everything that's in the gap is L. So I have L, that's part of my volume. Uh, I've got the gap, that's another part, that's a constant. The only thing that's moving is this part of it here that I circled here. That's where you have to do a little bit, bit of geometry. But the expression ends up being R. That's We've defined R as the distance from the center to the corner of, of that moving piece. Plus we have to take into account the width of the moving piece, which corresponds to the width of the entire magnetic uh, core. So that was A. And, no, no, I take it back. Where is the A at? 
Oh, I don't think I need to worry about the A. I apologize. Can't read my writing. It's just, this is the expression. 0.5 times G, the gap length, times theta. So this whole expression right here is the theta dependency, and it's really what you're always looking for. Now, since we have two gaps, there's a factor of two times this whole expression here. And there is your energy. So now you just have a co-energy expression. And so if you were to just multiply everything out for the co-energy, you end up with, and, and we're going to take this expression here, HAG, and plug it in here. So that means that we'll end up with a, the turns and the current and everything else. And so it ends up simplifying to this expression here, mu naught n squared i squared times the length times the radius that we define plus 0.5 g times theta. And this is the thing that will vary. And then that's divided by 4g. And so if we want to find the torque, we would simply take the partial derivative with respect to theta of this expression, which is quite simple. You just take the derivative of it. And uh, so the torque and we're just using this, this equation right here. So the torque ends up being equal to the partial derivative of that co-energy in the air gap with respect to theta. And we're also going to evaluate it at i. What that means is really this i is not changing with theta, okay? We're evaluating at an instant point, and that's a very key thing to remember. So this is i, it's, it's evaluated at a current i, and so your final expression is mu naught n squared i squared l r plus 0.5 g over 4g. So this would be you know, your final answer. And I think the homework problem is identical to this. So is there any questions about this? I want to point something out. Notice that we didn't calculate an inductance, did we? Could we have done it? because we could have used this expression instead. It wouldn't have been difficult to do this, but it would have taken time and it wouldn't have been necessary. Because if you, you know, if, if you've got any, you already know with a structure like this how to calculate the inductance. So you now, what you've got is you have a position dependent inductance or a spatially dependent inductance. And uh, you could have derived it, but it would have taken extra steps and it wouldn't have been necessary. So we just, and that's the key point of this example here. So if there's no questions, I'm going to give you another example where you actually would use inductance. And this is, I'll call this a single phase reluctance motor. It's actually very similar. It's actually looking more like a reluctance motor. It's looking more like uh, some of the actual rotating machines, motors or generators that we're going to talk about. And what that means is it has a shaft. It's cylindrical. It has um, only one winding on what we would call, there's actually two pieces to this, and I think it's maybe now's a good time to introduce it. 
that you're going to have with any uh, machine, rotating machine. You have a stationary part. This is called a stator. And that part is usually fixed, right? It's usually on some kind of a mount of some kind that's holding everything in place. And then you have this, the, this part of it that you're letting it move. That's called a rotor. Now, these are the general terms for these things. Some people uh, are used to hearing words like armature and things like that. These are, those terms are, are really artifacts of specific machine implementations. And it doesn't, a rotor is not an armature. It, you might have an armature that is on the rotor. And uh, I just want to make that very clear to everybody. So the general term is rotor and stator. I've got uh, a winding that is right here. And notice this, this winding is, is going down the axis of the machine. So you, you're just going down this length of the machine. And uh, as a result, it, it goes into the machine, let's say on the top. So if I were to kind of zoom in on this thing here, there'd probably be a little X right there. And there'd be a dot right here. And in reality, what's happening is on the other end of the machine, you've probably got this winding folding over around the outside an end. They usually call this like an end winding. That it's so it's going to come back to the other side. And as a result of this, you will have a flux that's produced that if you just apply the right hand rule and assume that your your hand is going in your in where the x is and the flux is in the middle so there's a flux that's being produced as a result of this winding in this direction. So a lot of times you just see an arrow that says, okay, I've got this flux right here in the quadrature axis to the, uh, when I say quadrature, to the line between the, the supply and return of this. That's where your flux is, right here. So anyway, in this example though, because you have a winding, you can have a flux, you can have a flux linking that winding, you have an inductance. And so I may just express what I have here as an inductance. But the inductance in general, you recall that our gen, uh, let me go back one minute here. Remember our general expression for inductance was um, turns squared. This is a self-inductance. So if you only have one winding, you've only got a self-inductance. Turns squared divided by the reluctance, whatever the total reluctance of the machine is. I'm going to introduce a new term, which I call permeance right now. Permeance is the inverse of the reluctance. And so I can have an inductance that is n squared times the permeance. So these are equivalent expressions. It's easier to think about rotating machines in terms of permeance instead of reluctance. Because what, we, what we're really after is we're after an inductance that's going to vary with rotational position. So that means that I've got 
starting at the center of this thing right here, I can create an axis, kind of an x-axis, if you will. And there's an angular movement, theta, of, the, of this thing. So it's moving in this direction. And what is happening, though, is that in order for this thing to produce torque, since it only has just this one winding, then there has to be a position dependency in the inductance. And does anybody see where that position dependency might be? If you, if you observe this rotor, I'm going to give you the answer kind of, but this is not a round rotor. It's kind of a football-shaped rotor. So where, where's the dependency of inductance coming from? Can anybody... The two oval ends, the, the gap would be the closest, right? Yep, exactly. And so as this thing moves, the, 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 the short part of the gap is changing, right? So it might move to a different position over here, and the short gap might be there. You can imagine this thing like lining up over here, right? So the gap length is moving, and you remember that that reluctance is uh, is equal to the gap. We'll call it G mu naught over the area of the gap. And so the permeance would be mu naught area of the gap divided by g. And what, what we can do is we can actually describe um, the, the um, fundamental, or I'd say the average dominant shape of the inductance uh, position as, a, as sinusoidally changing. So essentially what we're saying is that L is going to be equal to N squared times some P uh, constant, and we could call it a cosine or a sine. And there's a variation with theta. Now, how many uh, how many ver how many times do you think just looking at this thing over one three hundred and sixty degrees? I'm going to see a maximum permeance and a minimum permeance. If you imagine the small gap, there's actually two gaps here. The small passing by a I've really made a mess of my picture here, but passing by a, a specific point on the stator, for example, being observed, it's going to see a small gap and a big gap and a small gap. How many times do you think it's going to see a, a variation there? One, uh, once or twice? We'll see it twice. Right two times. There's going to be, it's really going to look, if you think of it as a sinusoidal variation, it's going to look like that. This is if it was a sine, you know, so if it's a cosine, this is one, this is 180 degrees movement, and then this is the next 180 degree movement here. So it's going to go two times, so there's a two theta. So then I can say that the other thing is that there's going to be some average, in fact, I'm going to use, I used the wrong term here. I'm going to call this P2, but there's going to be some average permeance. It's because there is, the gap doesn't completely close. I mean, the machine wouldn't move, right? It, it would just rub. So there has to be some averaged, effectively constant D inductance here. And so that's what this is times the N squared. So what I have is I have a inductance that is equal to 
some L naught that's associated to this P naught plus some L2 associated to this P2 here cosine 2 theta. And I've got a current I that I'm evaluating. Now since I have L and I have I, which of these expressions am I going to use to find the torque? The, which, which one do you think? Number one, number two, Last one. number three. Right, you're going to use the third one. So you're going to take the derivative of that with respect to theta. So the torque, quite simply, is going to be equal to I squared over 2 times the derivative with respect to theta of L naught plus L2 cosine 2 theta. And then this ends up being equal to minus. Now here's an interesting thing. There's some kind of symmetry that's going to show up as we look at these, and like Mustafa was asking about the negative sign and all that, well, in the sign, well, we have it. Now, it's because we chose cosine. And um, it's from this point forward, I'm going to be using cosines when I describe the physical movement of things. And I'll always end up with a sign. I could use sine. And then I would end up with cosine terms here, but uh, it would be mathematically correct. But as we start to think about variations in the current and position, which is what we'll see with AC machines, we'll find out that if you use sines, everything's going to still, whether you sine or cosine, you're going to end up with the same basic form. So it's essentially going to be equal to the derivative of this is we have a negative because the derivative of a cosine is a negative sign. So it's negative. The derivative of this is zero, right? So all you have left is that, the mo moving part. So two times sine two theta and the negative because it, that's the derivative of a cosine. It looks a lot like it looks a lot like this expression here, doesn't it? I can't I'm not gonna try to go too much further on that, you know, analogy here, but there is a kind of a symmetry in everything here that um, there's a lot of complexity to, to really understand to get back to this kind of relationship here, but I just kind of have to take my word for it that that you can get back to that kind of expression. And so anyway, this is the final answer for the torque. So it's quite simple, right? And I, I gave you a couple of examples. So, so how, how come the torque is not dependent on the radius uh because we built it into the permeance uh variable variables so we could have gone oh. in and done some geometrical stuff and we would have come up with uh we could pull that out it's in here it's buried in here it's inside here because the area of the gap is this Here's the gap that you're talking about. So notice that I had the flux crossing the gap. Let me just take half of the gap. Okay, so I mean, it's taking a snapshot of, of just a portion of this thing. I'm trying to make sure that it's not the same length. So there's your rotor, and there's your stator stator back iron the gap the flux is crossing the gap here it's flux it's crossing this gap 
So the area of the gap, it's just like when we talked about this example here, where we had this thing moving in this direction, we had a gap and we have a gap here, right? The gap area is this. This is for, a, I'm just showing a piece of a linear kind of rectangular shaped core. This is core. This is core. That's core. So what's the area? The area of the gap, the cross-sectional area is in the middle, right? So if you took a distance r out to that point, the average middle of that point, which corresponds to this, is a function of r. Does that answer that question? Or yeah? Yeah, I got it. So it's, it somehow is hidden in the eye also at the final form. Not the eye. It's not in here. It's in the, it's in the, oh yeah. Yes, it is. I would agree because we've, well, no, it's, uh, oh no, hold on. We left out L2. Darn it. It's hidden in here. I wrote this wrong. It's sine, it's minus 2 L2 sine of 2 theta. It's not in the I. It's in the L2. So there's going to be a, a difference between the, the, there's a big gap and a little gap. There's really multiple radiuses here. You know, you've got uh, a radius coming out to the, the wider part of the gap. Uh, and anyway, I'm kind of belaboring this maybe too much. I've got a radius here, R1. Uh, I've got a radius here, R2. Uh, I've got a radius out to the to there. You can call it R3. So essentially, you've got a radius out to the middle. That I got R0. And so really, the difference between R1 and R2 is what goes into L2. So if you didn't have a varying R, you would not have a torque. And I, I think that's a point I'm trying to make there. So the, the average uh, middle of the air gap is associated with the, with the P naught. The variation of radiuses, because we have a, a, ra a difference in the shape of this rotor, is related to the P2. And the, so these guys are related. And these guys are related. Does that make sense? Yeah, much better by now. Okay, good. I got, um, okay. Um, yeah, and Adam pointed out the L2 was missing. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, so let's go on to multiply excited machines. You guys got to be careful about asking me questions that I really get turned on about, and that's one of them that. Mustafa was just asking. Okay, so anyway, multiply excited machines. Can you have machines that are excited by more than one winding? That's what it means. Yes, you can. And so we're gonna I'm gonna go over this relatively quickly, but it, it because we're gonna be working with multiple windings from this point forward, but I just want to show you the top level understanding. So going back to our physics based approach where this is, you know, a, a energy storage system, you know, a magnetic energy storage. Same thing down here. Um, if it was a motor, we could put in a flux from one winding right here, we call that winding one. It's got a flux linkage, lambda one, and we've got a flux linkage, lambda two, and then they have an associated current 
I1 and I2. We can get out of that either a, uh, a, a torque or a force, right? I'm not going to talk much about force right now, just torque. We can get out of it an angular position or a linear, a linear, uh, linearly moving position of x, either way. And then if it was a generator, let's just say that we've got a rotation generator. I could put in a torque and I have a, a theta rotation. And I've got these, I can get out winding uh, power, a voltage or, or a, so flux linkage is, is really, if you take the derivative of that, that's a voltage, right? Uh, and a current. So I can get a, if you, I, I can get an energy associated with uh, lambda one and I one, and I can in, have additional energy associated with lambda two and I two. Now, how you look at these machines, and I want to just think about rotating machines right now, is in terms of this expression here, this matrix. It could, this has just got two windings. Note, you could have three windings. You could have four windings. You could have five, maybe, if you want. I mean, you can have as many windings as you want. I'm just going to write three of them down here that are the most common, three, four, and six, or you can, you can have two. And why I say common, this is a DC machine. This is a synchronous machine. And this is an induction machine. or called an asynchronous machine. So we're going to go through these three machines for the rest of the class. Um, so you can have more than two windings, but I don't want to overwhelm everybody by the math. But essentially, what this says is that the, the winding one is a function of the two currents. So if you were to multiply out this matrix, for example, Lambda 1 is L11, that's a self-inductance. Now these inductances, each of them may or may not have a position dependency. But if none of them have a position dependency, then you don't have a motor or a generator. You can't produce torque, or you can't put torque in and get electrical energy out. So it has to, one, at least one of these windings has to have a position dependency. So I've got this is times I1. I'm just multiplying out this just to show you. And this is L12 theta I2. And then lambda 2 is L21 theta I1 plus L22 theta I2. So your cell, you have your uh, I don't know, all these doggone colors are going to confuse people. You've got your self-inductance, right? And you've got your, your mutual inductance. So how do you find, you can find expressions. We could go through a whole class period, but it's really not worth the effort right now and we can derive energy expression. Now the energy, if you're interested, we're not going to have to use this expression because it's just too complicated. But if, if you want to find energy, you actually have, remember when, you, when we derived the energy, our state variables were the flux linkages. We would have to show currents in terms of 
flux linkages. So you'd have to do this matrix inversion and you'd have to come up with these expressions right here for I1 and I2 if you want to come up with a co-energy that is related to lambda and L. So, you know, recall again going back, what was the single, single winding? Very simply, the energy which is a function of lambda and theta was equal to lambda squared over 2 L theta. Just adding one more winding got us to this horrifically ugly equation right here. That's what the energy is. And you have to do an inversion. This D is your determinant um, um, for a 2 by 2 matrix inversion. So it's not easy to, to find energy uh, from a two-winding machine. But co-energy, on the other hand, and we, can co we could have gone through and derived this quite simply, you know, in the same way we did where we looked at, um, we would have, say, call this theta, we could call this I1, we could call this I2, and we say, here's my co-energy right here. It's a function of I1, I2, theta. And basically derive these expressions, right, by integrating paths along these axes. And the result is we get this expression for co-energy. So remember, the co-energy was one half L I squared, or it would be the L has to have this position dependency in order for there to be any torque. And really that's what we're after here, you know. There is energy if you don't have a uh, position, but there won't be any torque. It's just stored static energy. So L a function of theta quite simply, right? Now it becomes this. So we end up having a co-energy in terms of the self-inductance term right here. L11, L22, and then the mutual inductance L12. And now we could simply find the torque in three different ways, just like we did before. Partial derivative of the expression of the energy evaluated at a specific flux points. The partial derivative of co-energy evaluated at specific currents. Or this expression here. Okay? Now we're right at the last piece of this here, I get kind of upset with myself, but so anyway, I'm just going to take a few minutes if it's if it's OK here, talk about this multiply excited machine, and then we'll be completely set up to talk about the mo all the diff chapter four. At the, and here's a machine with two windings. I have a winding on the rotor right here, and I have a winding on the stator. So the stator, you know, looks like our typical magnetic core. And then I've got this rotor moving here. Now, note it, now uh, I'm not going to tell you yet. Now this, this particular example is just going to move you in a direction, but notice it's connected to a spring. So it's not going to be moving all the way around. It's not going to be doing this kind of thing continuously. It's just going to go move this way, move that way. It's kind of moving two ways. So it's it's really kind of an actuator. You could say, okay, I could wind my windings really loosely on this machine and it'll just uh, pick up the slack and it's okay, but 
The trick is how you get the current onto the rotor, and we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. Um, but anyway, I've got two windings, and uh, so lambda 1 is on the stator right, right here, and lambda 2, wind 2 is on the rotor. And you could go through a lot of uh, kind of chapter 2 type of analyses and come up with inductance and spec expressions for this. But this problem gives you those. And this is typically, I'm not going to make you guys do geometric, except for that one homework problem. This isn't really a geometry class, okay? But uh, I'm going to write the, the final expression. L11 is the self-inductance is 3 plus cosine 2 theta. And there's a, there is, if it were to go all the way around, you know, if you're, if you're going to move all the way around 360 degrees, you would get a 2 theta variation in inductance. So it's, we do need to put this term in there, even though we're only moving part of the way it's still based on 360 degree rotation. And then this would be times 10 to the negative 3. This is actually Henry's, right? That's the same as saying 3 plus uh, 1 cosine 2 theta millihenries. And it's kind of saying, okay, my I got an L naught of the one one that is three millihenries, and I have an L two of the one one that is one millihenry. That's another way to think about this. And then I've got an L one two mutual, which is the mutual inductance between these two windings here, 0.3 cosine of theta. Now here's an interesting thing, and it'll become clearer, and this is again millihenry, that when we have a, we actually have an example here of two windings, and we can call this winding here a field winding. We can call this winding here an armature winding. And this is actually what I would call a synchronous machine. And it will have to have AC currents. Uh, on, uh, I'm sorry, let me just not get too ahead of myself. This will be AC here. So the current either supplied or if it was a generator, if you were moving this thing and trying to produce a voltage, the current here would be alternating current. But here you would want to supply a DC current. So it's kind of like a magnet. And so essentially the field is like a magnet that you're moving. And the armature is getting an AC current in it as a result of the movement. And that's really what the difference is between these two types of windings. So this is kind of saying, OK, what I really have is I've got a mutual inductance call it L sub M equal to 0.3 millihenries. It's really due to this DC rotating field and it's it doesn't it's only a it's only got a position. It's not there's no static inductance there. That's very common. And then the final inductance is L22. Uh, in this case it's such a weird structure, but it's 30 plus 10 
cosine 2 theta, probably because the winding on the field is so, has a lot, a lot of turns, which is typically true of the of field windings. And you have typically less turns on your armature winding there. And so it's 30 plus 10 cosine 2 theta millihenries is saying that you've got a static self inductance of 30 millihenries and a varying self inductance of 10 millihenries peak. So now all you, since you've got these three inductances, you simply go back to this expression right here. And you're going to say, okay, let's plug them in. So I've got to take a derivative of L11, of L22, and of L12. And that's really how you solve this problem. And uh, this is really the kinds of problems I would be having you do in homework or exams here. So the, the torque expression here ends up being, since you were given inductance and you're given the current, the both of the currents, you got I1 squared over 2. Uh, and the derivative of this Okay, so that ends up being, for example, um, minus 2 times 10 to the negative 3 sine of 2 theta plus i2 squared over 2 um, I don't mean to make it look like this is a absolute value the derivative of the self-inductance of, of the other winding. You now that's going to be minus 20 sine of 2 theta. And then you're going to add the product of the two currents times the derivative of the self the mutual inductance. And that ends up being um, uh, 0.3. Oh, notice here, this isn't a millihenry. I screwed up on this. I'm looking at exa this actually example, I think 3.7 in the textbook. 0.3, so it's 0.3 henrys. Usually your mutual inductance is a really big, big number. So that'd be the same as saying 300 millihenries. 0.3 times the, again, sine of theta. And there's no two variation on this one. There's, so there's your total expression. Any last minute questions? I apologize for going over, but Okay, silence, we still have what? Tell me that you still hear me and that it somewhat works. Uh, yeah, it makes sense. Somebody asked that L12 and L22 are in Henry, though, in the chat. Where at? Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I didn't see that chat. Okay, so this is Henry here. Uh... If I get rid of the negative 3, it becomes a millihenry. So it doesn't say that in the, exa the example problem. But millihenry is a typical way of looking at things, right? Does that kind of answer that concern? Oh, no, I think I see what you said. L22 is Henry's. Ah, okay. I'm looking at it. You're right. I'm like looking at the book. L22 is Henry's. That's a huge number, but it's because you've got lots and lots and lots of 
field terms. Typically, you're, you've got in your field one, you probably got NF is equal to 5,000 turns. And you've got NA is maybe equal to 10 turns. That's why you've got this huge discrepancy, you know, whole huge difference. And that's very common. Because this guy here is, is trying to make as good of a magnet as possible to get as much uh, torque out of this thing as he possibly can. And, and again, to remind you, right, L, the L is really thinking about it in terms of either N squared, so you could say N1 squared times some reluctant, or not reluctance, it's a permeance now, which is kind of a sinusoidal permeance. L22 is like an L2 squared times sinusoidal permeance L12 is going to be an N1 N2 times the permeance. And, and when I say N, I should just put in the real values here. N. I said N1 N2, right? But now I'm calling one a field winding. So this is N field. This is N A, and then this is going to be N A, N F. So I'm basically saying that this is, this is going to be a lamb, lambda field is lambda 2, and lambda armature is lambda 1. Okay, and I think that's it. See some people are starting to drop off, and I see finally a question. My question came up. Raja's concern about L1, L2. Yeah, I just saw it. <laughs> so just showed up in my internet. Okay. Yep. That's right. You're looking at the book. That's good. Okay. Anyway, uh, the next homework. This homework's due Thursday. You guys have everything to do it. The next homework on homework. Five, we'll have one of these, and we're going to have some synchronous machine. Uh, I didn't get to synchronous machine, so I apologize for those of you who will see synchronous machines in the lab for the first time. But it will come back on it. Essentially, it has field and, and armature windings, and we'll go from there.